Hello and welcome to the Family of Things, a podcast series of ideas, life and how we live it. I'm Helen Shaw and in this series I get to meet people determined to make the most of our trips around the sun. And today I'm with a man known for his winning speed and perhaps more recently for his winning food, champion runner and celebrity master chef David Gillick. David's been one of Ireland's most successful track athletes. He's won two European gold medals and been a world finalist twice. David, you retired last year or at what, 30? 31. But what's happening now? I mean, your speed and your records were all in the 400 metres. And I was just looking this morning, you still hold the Irish national record in the 400 metre. Yeah, I still hold the outdoor 400 metre record and also the indoor 400 metre record. So I think the fact that I was the, the first Irish person to run under 45 seconds and 45 seconds is generally kind of world class 400 metre running. And that was always one of my goals. I wanted to get to a level where I was competing against the best athletes in the world. And that was what it took to run sub 45 seconds. So it's great. You know, yes, I have retired, but there still is part of me there. So it's nice to actually open up a programme and still see your name beside the record. Sometimes we forget that, that many of the records, the Irish records in track and field, they're there for a long time, that Sonia still has a rake at them, Sonia Sullivan. And your one was set, what, in 2009? Yeah, I ran 44.77 in 2009, which was the first time I broke 45 seconds. It took me probably about two years to do that. And like you said, yes, it's still there. And we do have some records that... They go way back. There's a few that are well over 10 years, even more than that. And I think, you know, when I won a medal in 2005 in the European Indoors, that was our first gold medal in 83 years. And then the record for the 400 in 2009, you know, I brought it to a new level. And I think that really helped me with a lot of confidence and also break into the world final then a couple of months later in 2009 in Berlin. But what was that day like, 2005? Oh, when I think back to that... I actually think of the nerves. It was my first kind of individual major championship and it was also my first indoor season. So I had come into 2005, January, February. My form was good. I was enjoying my training and I decided, yeah, I was going to do a couple of indoor races. Didn't really have any expectations or goals in and around that European championships in Madrid that year, but I hadn't even qualified, to be honest. But I did a, a race, ran well, did another race, ran well. But the interesting thing was I was winning those races. So I got into kind of a win streak. And after that, I forgot about the times. It was a case of just winning races. And I went over to the British Championships in Sheffield that year. And I won that. And I ran a fast time that put me in about sixth in Europe. And I'd qualified then for the European Championships. And it was only at that moment that I kind of think, God, maybe I could do okay here. So the way that weekend in Madrid turned out was I ran very well in my semi-final. I ran 46 one which was a huge PB for me. It wasn't an Irish record at the time. The Irish record stood at 45.99 by Paul McKee. But I'd made the final. And once you're in the final, in indoor 400 meter running, anything can happen. Now, a bit of background around that weekend, I was so nervous. I can remember on the Wednesday, we were flying out and my mum was making lunch for me before she dropped into the airport. And I was in front... As they do. As they do, yeah, looking after me. I was in front of the TV. So she came in, gave me my lunch, went back out. And I remember looking at my lunch going, I can't eat this. I was so nervous already, three, four days before I was due to run. But I got a bit of lunch into me, got on the plane, flew over to Madrid, got through my semi-final. And then after the semi-final, had that little bit kind of like an hour or two of relief where you're like, you can relax a bit. Yeah, you've, you've raced, everything's gone well. Then it was the mind switch to the final the next day and the nerves came back and my coach at the time Jim Kidd the following day the day of the final the final was on in the evening time he knew I was nervous it was hard to eat just all these anxiety everything and he brought me out for lunch I can remember being in this restaurant and there was a chicken breast on the plate and I was just trying to get it into me I couldn't but I was so nervous and I had to get out of the restaurant and I was literally on the side of the road with my hands on my knees. This was before the race. But the funny thing was, the minute I got into the warm-up area, I was instantly relaxed. And that's where I felt I was in control. And your head and body was there? Head and body, yeah. I, was, I, I felt I was just in the middle of the now and then it went from there. And the 400 metre, it's like that really for us watching it. It's over. What was that run like? I can remember the whole race, literally stride for stride. The favourite was... Is it like a picture when you think about it now? It's a film? Yeah, it's a film. Yeah, absolutely. With a soundtrack. (laughs) With a soundtrack, yeah. I wonder what soundtrack it is. (laughs) Something like Out of Gladiator would be cool. But I can remember the home favourite 
was a Spaniard called David Canal and he had ran pretty quick that year. So I was kind of looking at him as the guy that potentially was my main rival. The race went off and we had a Russian guy on the outside and he went off like a train. So when I came into the break, I kind of settled in in third place and these guys were ahead of me and they were bumping. And then I gained on them and I can remember coming around the bend and just a gap appeared and I went for the gap past the Russian and then I was chasing down David Canal around the last maybe 50 metres to go, got up on the shoulder and I, he had nothing and I went by him and I can remember just thinking, I'm going to win this. This is like, you know, it was something I didn't really expect but when you cross that line, I just could, I couldn't believe it really. It was something very surreal. It was the stuff of dreams but it was a massive drug. The fact that you can go and do a lap of honour with your national flag and, you know, there was loads of Irish in the crowd, family were there, friends were there. That single moment became my drug and I just wanted more. Fantastic. The key probably now is to go back because you grew up in Dublin, sporting family and running from the time you were a kid. Yeah, like sports. Um, I'm the youngest of four. Mum and dad were big into sport and they gave us every opportunity growing up. Where I grew up in Ballantyre, there was Dundrum Athletic Club, literally at the end of my road. And my brothers and my sister, they all did it. And I think mum kind of, you know, put me down that road as well. I enjoyed it. But I think kind of in school, I, I was the fastest in my class. And I think when you're growing up, that's very important. It's always who's, who's the fastest in the class. And I think that's where things started. And, you know, sports in my primary school was quite big as well. So we were quite competitive across an array of sports. Because you were playing GAA as well at mm. the same time. And, and in some ways you could have gone different routes at that stage. Yeah, I suppose like I was making a bit of progress with the Gaelic football. And that was up through my teenage years and things like that. But I enjoyed the running and I was winning kind of in my early teens. But then I went through a phase that I wasn't winning at all. And probably GAA kind of took over a lot more. But then I kind of swung back the other direction and I started doing well in athletics again, particularly from my secondary school, St. Benilda's. So I had to make a decision when I was about 18, 19. But the reason I made the decision to go to athletics was I went to the World Juniors in Jamaica in 2002. So I was maybe 18 years old and Usain Bolt was 16 years oh, old. Right. And in Jamaica, you've Usain Bolt, 45,000 people in the stadium shouting Bolt, Bolt, Bolt. I was watching this and I just thought, this is amazing. I want more of this. Takes leading the 200 final, heading towards the gold medal. Usain Bolt is a world junior So you're how old watching Usain Bolt? So I was 18 at the time, in Jamaica as well. So it was my first kind of like big trip. Outside Ireland. Outside, yeah, it was huge. Caribbean and the World Juniors. And it was just a brilliant, brilliant experience. And obviously Bolt was, even at that age, the next big thing. And I remember 45,000 people. It was on a Friday night and they were crawling and trying to climb over the walls to get into the stadium. It was such a big thing in Kingston, in Jamaica. And he came around to 200. That was his event he was running at the time and absolutely annihilated everyone and the whole crowd erupted. I'll never forget that, bolt, bolt, bolt. And the atmosphere just really kind of inspired me. And I remember at that single moment kind of thinking, I want more of this. This is absolutely amazing. So what was it about the 400 that it became your game? I think growing up and doing a lot of cross country in secondary school, but also doing a lot of kind of sprints then come the summer. So I had the speed, I had a bit of endurance. And as I got older, it kind of fell into around the 400. I, you know, I wasn't the quickest out and out over 100 or 200. And I wasn't the strongest, say, for like an 800 or 1500. So I kind of nestled in around the 400 metres. But interestingly, my first success on a domestic level was winning the 400 metre hurdles for my school at that was inter-level, so that was about fifth year. Now, I had the good pace, but I didn't really have great hurdling technique. So the following year, I decided, you know what, I'm going to get rid of the hurdles and I'm just going to do the 400 metres. And I actually ran really, really well that year, winning the school all Ireland, and that kind of then, you know what, I'm going to stick at 400. You were on the path. I was on the path, and it just went from there. And would somebody like Michael Johnston have influenced you? Yeah, would have watched Johnston, Roger Black, even kind of just after those guys, you had a lot of British athletes that were running really well over 400 metres, Jamie Bulge, Ewan Thomas. And these guys were on TV quite a lot and they were doing really, really well. And also from a sprinting perspective, they were white guys. 
and they were doing incredibly well at that level. Generally, 100 metres, 200 metres, and even 400 metres are dominant by the Caribbean athletes and the American athletes. So when you see people that you can relate to competing against these really great athletes, you kind of think, maybe. Maybe um, you could do it. Maybe you can do it. But we also had a lot of success over 400 metres on domestic level with some of the Irish guys. We had you know, the relay team in Sydney in 2000. We had Paul McKee. He won a bronze world indoor medal in 2006. We also had a guy that I would have grown up with through the ranks, Dave McCarthy, who was my age, but again, competed really well. So these guys kind of pushed me, I believe, to get to kind of where I was going. Because I think that is important. You can be really good, but if you don't see yourself in the picture, it's very hard to start aiming for it. And at that stage, people like you were making history in places like Madrid in 2005. But... What you're telling me really is that you needed those guys before you, even if it was only in the previous five years who'd already made it clear that, yeah, a white guy from Ballantyre might do it. It's almost like someone's building a path and you're on that path, but it's up to you then to take it a bit further. So the guys before me, you know, pushing the boundaries, bringing the Irish records down to like 45-5, that sort of territory, that's international standard. You're making qualifying for international games. But I think after Madrid, that win in Madrid kind of really gave me that belief that, God, you know what, maybe I could do something here. Maybe I could go and actually have this as a profession. I think at that moment, I kind of decided I wanted more. And that single lap of honour where you've got your national flag around your shoulders, you're on the podium, the national anthem's been played, like that's the stuff of dreams and that became my drug. I wanted more of that. And it's interesting when we think about what makes a winner. Talent for sure, training for sure, but that psychological frame of wanting it badly. You used the word earlier, drug, that you really need to want to be on the podium to make it happen. Yeah, like, and, and it's an honest drug. It, you know, I suppose drugs and athletics right now can be a bit controversial, but that was my honest drug. That was my endorphin. That's what I wanted. I wanted more of that because I felt good. We've worked with Katie Taylor and I made a doc with her in 2008. And she, as a kid, she saw Caruth and Wayne McCullough coming back on that open top bus. <laughs> and as a small kid said, I want that. Yeah. And that remained in her head as that battle cry that she wanted a gold medal and Olympics and she wasn't taking anything less. And in a sense, women's boxing was almost driven into the Olympics by people like Katie. So sometimes it's visualising it and it's also maybe heroes, like your image of what seeing Usain Bolt at that age certainly sounds transformational. Yeah, it was incredible. And even like the likes of Sonia Sullivan, obviously I would have grown up watching Sonia race an awful lot and, and win medals and I would have tuned into all the Olympic Games and just that environment, that kind of atmosphere that you see that really kind of gets you, even though you're watching it on a screen, it just, it was something that really kind of got me and I just kind of thought, God, if I could have 1% of that, I'd lap it up. But I think someone that I really would have looked up to was Sonia Sullivan because I think as an Irish athlete, we're few and far between on that kind of international world-class level. And to see someone like Sonia really compete there, and even before her, like Eamon Coughlin, people like that, it does kind of give, well, if they can do it, you know, why can't other people do it? Once you have that kind of determination and once you put your plan in place. For 100 metre, what makes a good runner at that pace, at that distance? There's a few things, to be honest. One, it's a very, very hard event. The training is absolutely relentless. So you have to be really, really mentally strong and also physically strong. Because when you're standing there, you know in 45 seconds that you're probably going to be on your back and you're probably going to be getting sick. So you've got to prepare yourself for that. It's very similar to a boxer getting into a ring. You're going to fight. And then it's obviously your kind of natural attributes. You've got to be fast. You've got to be strong. But I do think that it's a very mental game. and the training is relentless six days a week and you've got to put your body on the line. And because of the energy systems that you're using the whole time, there's a lot of lactic. And lactic acid is 400 metres best friend. When you come into that home straight, you're swimming in lactic and you've just got to keep pushing. It's mentally tough as well. And that's why I really focus on the mental side because if you have any little chink in your armour, you're not going to be able to sustain that lactic and the race will be over before you know it. So when did you move to Loughborough? So after 2005, I came home and everything was great. You know, I was getting recognised. I was getting headlines. I thought I was brilliant. I thought, yep, I'm fulfilling my potential here. I was still in college here in Dublin. It was good. I I kind of felt, you know, this is where I want to go. I was training well. 
but I think mentally I was I enjoyed it a little bit. I enjoyed that kind of you know You were young. I was young, yeah I was and I was in college and everything that comes with that and you know being recognised and skipping queues into nightclubs and stuff like that. Yeah, it's brilliant. I thought I was like a Premier League footballer. But then two thousand six <laughs> I went to the European Championships in Gothenburg and I came paddy last in my semi final. Absolutely paddy last. And I remember coming off the track and you have to walk through the mix zone. And I remember thinking, what am I going to say now when they say to you, David, what happened? I had no excuse. I had absolutely no excuse. And that single moment, I just said to myself, you know what? You bottled it. You absolutely bottled it. And I made two decisions coming away from that stadium on the walk back up to the hotel. And I was in tears. Like, it was like someone had just ripped my stomach out. I felt I let people down and I just decided... Or let yourself down. I left my... Yeah, I did. Like, I worked hard and, you know, maybe I just took it for granted. I'd won a a European title 12 months before and I kind of thought, this is easy, this is all great. Um, It kind of came easier to you in 2005. mm, It did. You weren't expecting it. I wasn't expecting it, absolutely. And that walk back up to the hotel, I decided, do you know what, David? You're never going to let that happen again. And number two, I didn't want to get to the age of 30 and look back and say... Why didn't I give it a go? And I'm kind of curious, who was around you then advising you? Who was talking to you? Because you had just pulled off an incredible feat just a, a year or so. Yeah, I've got, I got to be honest, like the, we had no structures in place. So it was almost like it was an afterthought. I came back with a gold medal and it was like, OK, we, we have a gold medalist here. What do we do? There wasn't any structures in place. So I was kind of left to kind of figure things out myself. And it was new to a lot of people. Like generally the success that we had in Irish athletics came from, say, the US collegiate system, where the athletes were almost away in an institution. Which is where Eamon Coughlin and John Tracy had gone through that experience. Absolutely. So to have an actual uh, domestic athlete who was training here in Dublin in a club environment, go and win a medal, it was a bit oh, we we didn't really expect that. So I was a little bit left to kind of figure things out. Like I was left to kind of figure out how to deal with the media, what to do with sponsors. My parents' phone was ringing with people going, oh, can David do this, can David do that? And yes, it's all great at the time, but it does get a little bit uncomfortable. And I can remember, you know, coming off Madrid and I was still in college and just getting the Lewis back in like normal. On the Monday, I just thought, I'll just carry on like normal. And you felt people were kind of looking at you a little bit. And that made me feel uncomfortable. I'm not the most outgoing and confident sort of person. So to kind of be sitting on the Lewis and kind of feel like the eyes are on you and then you open up the Metro, which they used to give out free and you're going, oh my God, I'm in the paper. (laughs) Has anyone else seen that? I'd shy away from it at times. And to be brutally honest, there was a period that I'd almost didn't really want to even walk down to the shop because if I bumped into someone who knew me, they'd be like, oh, how's running going? What's next? And I kind of just didn't really want to talk about it. So there was nobody really advising, advising me, yeah. even from a mental side of it, how, how you deal with this expectation. Because that's kind of one of the key factors. Coming off a championship where you win a medal, next minute everyone goes, oh, hang on, he's got another championship coming up. Oh, he's going to win this one. And you're kind of going... And you've got to keep your head <laughs> so grounded because that's the thing that's going to make you win. That's what happened in 2006. I just lost control of stuff. Even though I was still improving, like I ran personal best that, that year, but... When it came to the expectations and managing that, I kind of crumbled. You know, I, I didn't kind of roll it. it. It all kind of fell apart a bit. And so Loughborough University, why Loughborough? Well, I looked at where the best athletes were training. The best athletes in Ireland, the best athletes in Europe, the best athletes in the UK. I didn't feel it was the right time to make a move to America. Quite a big step going to the States. So I looked around Europe and obviously the best athletes at the time were, were in Britain. And one guy in particular who was up and coming, Martin Rooney, he had just ran really well in the juniors that year, the European juniors. And he was running like 45-3. So put that in perspective, that was 0.3 faster than what I was running at the time. I was running about 45-6. So like I said at the very start, I wanted to get down to like in and around 45 seconds. So I kind of looked at where he was training, who he was training with. And obviously that was Loughborough with the coach, Nick Dakin. So... I was in the gym in DCU one day and someone by the name Enda McNulty asked me, David, you know, you're an athlete, what's your goal? I said, oh, well, I want to run 45.5. 45.5 was a qualifying standard for the World and Olympics. And he said, oh, very good. And, and how are you going to do that? And I said, I'm going to train hard. And he said, and how are you going to do that? And I was like, uh, I just told you, I'm going to train hard. Then the penny dropped and I was like, how am I actually going to do that? 
Because a goal without a plan is a wish. And at that single moment, I actually thought to myself, how am I actually going to do this? Am I just going to say I'm going to run 45.5 and continue doing what I'm doing? So that all happened in the space of a week, would you believe? So I then met Enda for a cup of coffee in Dundrum. Because Enda's a coach. Enda's an actual sports psychologist. And his background, he won an All-Ireland with Armagh and he was an All-Star. But we kind of got on in the gym that day and he did a few kind of like workouts with me and stuff like that. So I wanted to pick his brain about this kind of move that I was going to make. So he helped me out in relation to the next steps. So I was planning a visit to Loughborough to meet the coach, to meet the training group, to see the to environment. Do a recce. To do a recce, absolutely. And I sat down with Enda in Dundrum and we wrote out, I had 10 questions. And he said, don't hop on the plane back to Dublin without answers to those 10 questions. And that's where it all started. So I'm not going to get all the 10 questions, but maybe what was the killer one? There was one or two in and around like challenging the coach. So it wasn't just about kind of... You're brilliant and you've done it with somebody yeah. else. What are you going to do with me? What are you going to do with me? How am I going to run 45 seconds or sub 45? And then there was a couple of questions in around the environment. So yes, the track element, the training was all very important. But where was I going to live? What were the practical side of things? You know, which was extremely important. So that was kind of a combination of the 10 questions. And to be fair, I got all my answers. And the decision to go to Loughborough then became very easy. All I ever wanted to do was was be a professional sports person. I think when I was a kid, I wanted to be a f- professional footballer, but that didn't work out. But I always wanted to be a full-time athlete. And I remember my first week in Loughborough, I just thought this was amazing. The environment, it was like an ecosystem. There were so many different sports, so many elite sports people that everyone was almost kind of feeding off each other. You'd go to the gym, you'd see another world-class athlete or world-class boxer or gymnast or whatever other sport training away and you're kind of thinking, God, this is really, really good. But it was also the routine, like the fact that training became very organized, very routine-based, very planned out, and I loved that. But I guess as always in life, something unplanned happened. You met Charlotte, another athlete at Loughborough. Yeah, like Charlotte's been there through it all. It's actually a funny story how we actually met because I was in... Not on the running track. It wasn't on the running track, no. I was living in a flat with a couple of other athletes, managed to get a property, and one of the guys I was living with was going to move in with me. (laughs) So typical two lads, he says, oh, it has to be two girls. You've got to get two girls in. So we got two girls in and one was Charlotte. So instantly in the first couple of months, I I remember thinking, God, I I think I like this girl. And I was like, no, 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 I'm living with her. It's really going to mess up the (laughs) flash. It's going to, and and it was Olympic year, the year before, oh wait, and I was thinking, no, 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 I want to keep things, you know, I'm an athlete. But, you know, I fell for her and it all started there. And I think Charlotte just understood, she got it. She understood me in a way that nobody else could in relation to my whole sport, the way I carried myself the way that I would suddenly kind of go into my own little world when I was preparing for a race or even a big session. She'd know when to give me a hug or else know when to kind of back off a little bit. And I think that's extremely important when you're an athlete. And I remember Charlotte always saying that she understood that athletics was my priority. She, she got it. You know, she understood that. And I remember when she said that to me. It's pretty cool for any girlfriend to say. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. Like, she, she just understood that, like, she was second best. <laughs> athletics was my, maybe my first love for a couple of years. But... I think as an athlete, you're OCD on things. You're a perfectionist, whether that's on the track or whether it's when you're making your lunch. You know, I was very, very into the whole holistic approach. I looked after my recovery, making sure I was getting 10 hours sleep a night. My nutrition, making sure that there was exactly 250 grams of sweet potato in a Spanish omelette. One day, Charlotte made the omelette and there's 250 and we had an argument, you know. (laughs) But she got that. She understood that this is David. He's trying to be the best that he can. He's only got a couple of years to do this. I'll get him up the aisle and then I can have him for the rest of her life. (laughs) What a wise woman. (laughs) So few of us get that. But I mean, is that where the whole food thing started? When I moved to Loughborough, I had moved away from home. Like when I was living in Dublin with my parents, mum did the did shopping, mum did all the cooking. That was it. And mum was grand cooked. Like, don't get Mrs. me wrong. Mrs. Gillick, you know, you're a brilliant cook. <laughs> I'm not having a go there whatsoever. She does a mean Sunday roast. But as an athlete, I was kind of thinking, is this what I should be eating? How do I improve? So when I moved over to Loughborough, I was doing my own shopping. So obviously then I started looking after what I was putting into the trolley. 
and then as a result what I was making at home so I wanted to make sure that I was recovering optimally and I'd gone now to train six days a week before I was probably training maybe four days the ante was really raised the intensity even the work that I was doing on the track so I had to make sure it was part of being an athlete I had to make sure that I was recovering and nutrition was one of those kind of pillars if you like and that's kind of where it all started. And David that battle to stay fit to stay at the top of your game is tough. Mm. I mean, you had a lot of battles with injuries. You know, sprinting is a very intense activity. It's the volumes and the intensity that you you put through your body is colossal. For example, when you sprint, you're putting 18 times your body weight through your lower limbs. So if you can imagine your calves, your soleus, your Achilles, these are all common sprint injuries. And unfortunately for me, I've had almost all of them. And it's something you do have to cater for. So there's ways around it, you know, because you have to be proactive. But sometimes your body will just break down. So you have to manage that. But injuries are something that are part and parcel with sport. And they're challenging. And they will creep up on you before you know it. It could be some random Tuesday that you're feeling brilliant. Next minute, it feels like someone's just shot you in the calf. That's how brutal it is. How do you cope with it psychologically? Because it's, as you say, it's part for the course. It's it's one of the outcomes when yeah. you're in a high impact sport. But when it makes you miss things that you spent four years mm. training for. How devastating is that when it can push you out? Yeah, unfortunately, I did experience it in 2012. And the Olympics comes around every four years. And it, it is the pinnacle of many athletes' lives. And to be brutally honest, it's like a death in the family. To cope with it, it's a massive, massive learning curve. I think for me, initially, I didn't cope. I got badly injured in 2011. And it was literally like one split moment. Everything was just chucked up in the air. The routine that I had regards my training, all the the goals, my planning for the year. You try and stay positive. You kind of go, okay, look, I'll give myself a few days here. I'll get treatment. It'll be okay. But then it's not. That was my soleus muscle. So in between your calf and your Achilles. And I remember when I was in touch with a doctor, I was in America at the time. And I was speaking to the doctor back home. And I'll never forget his words were like, David, please, please, please give this respect because it tricks you. I learned myself because of all the nerves that go in, you almost think, oh, I'm okay I'm today. Let's I'm fine go. today. Yeah. I can train and then it goes again. So in 2011, this happened and that was very, very difficult. And I didn't run 2011 that season because my injury, I was out for 10 weeks. Unfortunately, I got back into training and then it happened again. I got a reoccurrence before London, a little bit worse this time. And that was on St. Patrick's Day 2012. When you get injured, you feel your confidence takes a massive hit as well. And you feel you're falling off, you're falling behind your competitors. So you've got to make sure that your confidence is still there. You know, if you can recover from the injury and get back on the start line, you want to make sure that mentally you feel you're on a level playing field with everyone else and you trust your body. And that's a big factor as well, learning to trust your body again. So missing London 2012 has to have been one of the most difficult periods. (laughs) When you look back now, beyond that moment we're talking about right at the beginning in 2005, when things really changed, when you look back, which are the high points? When I look back, obviously Madrid was fantastic. And then in 2007, I retained that title, which Birmingham. was in Birmingham. And like that was brilliant. Going back to that illustration of doing the lap of honour and the national anthem, like I got to do that again. Which and it buried Gothenburg. It did, it did. And it kind of put me back kind of on the path, if you like, that I was going places. But I think I always wanted to be a world-class athlete. I always wanted to be up there with the best athletes in the world. Jamaica, athletes from the Caribbean, from America. Those were the people who run the fastest over 400 metres. And I wanted to run sub-45. And in 2009, I did that. But I backed that up then in the World Championships by coming sixth. And I think for me, making a global final was really and truly where I wanted to go. And yes, you can never take away winning. That's absolutely fantastic. But I think deep down, all the hard work and everything I put in to make that final and come in a very credible sixth in the world really was probably the the pinnacle, I think, for me. So that was 2009. And then 2010, you go even further. Yeah, I think 2009 really gave me belief. 2010 started really, really well. Ran... One run indoor in Birmingham, the track that I'd previously won my Europeans back in 07. And 
my first run of the year and I equaled my Irish record, 45-52, which put me about second or third in the world that year. Starts to pull away on the top bend, the indoor specialist, twice the European indoor champion, and this is his very best ball, equaling his lifetime best, 45.52 seconds, and that will stamp him as a serious contender when the big prizes are handed out in Doha. So ahead of the World Indoor Championships, I was in a really, really good, good place. Yeah, absolutely, and I went to Doha, got through my first round, got through my semi-final, made the final, and unfortunately I got disqualified in the final which was one of these situations where I was frustrated I was gutted because I could have won that race I could have been world champion and everything that that brings you know and that was hard but that's indoor 400 meter running it's a lot of bumping there's athletes coming across here and unfortunately I was on the wrong end of it and I got bumped and my stride went and I, I was gone but I got back into my form was really good and I ran really well that year I went sub-45 another three times and went into the European Championships. I think I was ranked number two, but there was about eight guys there within 0.1, 0.2 of each other. It was really, really competitive, and literally the final went that way. We all came into the home straight in a line. Unfortunately, I think I tried just that little bit too hard, and I got tense, and I missed the gold medal by 0.2, and I missed a bronze medal by 0.03 of a second, and I finished fifth. <laughs> nanoseconds mm. that define our lives yeah but when did the decision really land that you were going to call it quits I kind of you know like that promise I made myself in 2006 that I wanted to get the age of 30 and look back and say I gave it a shot and after missing London, which was really, really difficult, even when the Olympics were on, I didn't come back to Dublin. I stayed away because I just... It was painful. It was extremely painful. I thought I'd be okay. I thought I could get through it, and I actually did a bit of media work around it, but I was just putting on a face. Deep down, I was in tears, you know. But I decided after that, I want to give it another go. I have a desire, I have that fire in my belly. So I actually relocated down to Australia to train for about 10 months um, down in Canberra. And Charlotte came with me as well. So we really enjoyed living down there and training was going really well. And I was preparing for a race in Japan. And there was a couple of British guys that had come over to do a training camp. We had local Australian athletes and we all did a session together. And I absolutely annihilated them. But unfortunately, I tore my Achilles in the last rep. And it was, it was one of those things. I, I felt really good and it was such an uplifting session because I was better in guys that were really good but I got hurt and that was it and I tried to come back from it I did everything but I just couldn't run it was just far far too painful and that was the clincher by this stage I hadn't competed in about two to three seasons so I wasn't making a living I had lost my funding sponsors things like that and I kind of just really felt how can I continue doing this and the, I think deep down the desire had to be there I think it was just beginning to go out a little bit. That flame was beginning to falter. And then I came home and I, I turned 30 and I kind of just thought to myself, maybe, will I, won't I? And to be honest, that went on for 12 months till I was 31. And then I just said, it's time to call it a day. And when did the decision come to enter Celebrity Masterchef? Because I suppose I'd have to say I, I was completely taken aback by that when I saw it happening. And the fact that you then went on to win it in 2013 was it part of coping with the London 2012 hit in the stomach? There was a bit of that, to be honest. And what had actually happened was I was in Australia and that training session that I got injured, I came home and I had a tantrum and everything. And the next morning I woke up to an email about would I be interested in taking part in MasterChef. And at that time, I was currently watching Australian MasterChef. Which is apparently brilliant. It is absolutely amazing. Anywhere I've travelled, I've watched MasterChef. It's an absolutely fantastic show. So when I read this email, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'd love to do this. Then it was a case of going, hang on a second. I'm going to put myself on national TV and try to cook. So I'd agreed to it. And then I got really nervous. I was like, what am I doing? But I wasn't going to run. It was over. And it gave me something to go just throw myself into straight away. Because David, you are very competitive, very focused, very disciplined, it sounds, but competitive. And this was another way maybe to channel that? Yeah, and it's, it's funny because initially I thought, oh, this is a bit of fun. This is all good. And, you know, it's something different, something that I might enjoy doing. But when we got on set... I wasn't really competitive against anyone else. I was really competitive against myself. Sure, yeah. And 
the whole idea was, right, okay, don't make a fool of yourself. Try not to get kicked out first round. And then after that, enjoy it. Luckily, I managed to stay in. And I kind of went from there. I started really enjoying it. And before you come into the kitchen and you have all the cameras, you stand there and the crew are going, okay, wait, we've got two minutes, three minutes, whatever it is. You're standing there and you get nervous. That reminded me of the call room before I went out to the track. And in a weird way, I missed that. So when I got more into the episodes, I was like, hey, I'm loving come this. On. <laughs> I, I want more of this. And I suppose, yeah, I got competitive, but because we were doing different dishes at times, you weren't really necessarily competitive with the other contestants. It was more about you just wanted to give the best that you could give. So in some ways it becomes that challenge which you have all the time on the track as to, can I pull this off? Yeah, like some of the tasks you're kind of thinking, God, I'm not going to be able to do this. And you come out the other side. And I think even winning it is something that I never thought would happen. But I think deep down, because I was an athlete for literally 10, 11 years, and that's all I did, I felt I was just an athlete. So to win something different, something that like requires complete different skill, I felt it gave me a huge lift. I actually kind of realized, you know what, maybe I'm not just David Gillick, the athlete. And that's what I thought people just saw. So I was an athlete for like 10, 11 years, you retire, oh, that's the athlete. That's your man that used to run. And I can remember I was in Dundrum about two or three days after the final was aired. And I had a complete different demograph of society recognize me. And that was a little bit very, it was just completely strange. But at the same time, I'd missed that in a weird way. I'd missed that from being an athlete, like where you come off the back of like success, you win a medal. Yeah, you get that recognition. And now I had it for a complete different reason. And it just reminded me of the success I had in athletics. It made me feel good. Because you're a winner. And in a sense, it's that strive to be a winner. And it, it, what you said right at the beginning was when you talked to Enda that day in UCD, your goal was to run sub 45 seconds. You did that. You nailed it. But I'm curious about what do you think makes a winner. When you look at it now, and in many ways you've described that by paralleling it with MasterChef, about determination sometimes being more important yeah. to get us through yeah. to the end game. Yeah, I agree 100%. Like determination and your will are absolutely paramount. But I also think one of the other key elements is ownership. We're all born with various talents, but only you as an individual can own your talent. And that's one thing I think I did. I didn't waste it. I decided to own my talent and really work on it and improve it in order to fulfill my potential. That idea of seeing that in, in young people and bringing it out is very important to you. You're pretty determined to also maybe get that message to kids in primary school and onwards. Absolutely. Like, I think what it's done for me as a person, like the confidence I've gained within myself from my sport by simply just owning my talent and having that will and determination to work on it and improve it. Like, I believe there's serious talent in this country from a sports perspective, but sometimes it's left to the individual. Sometimes we rely on my coach or the governing body or someone else to almost take control and put you on that path and make you win an Olympic medal. That's not going to happen. It comes down to the individual and the ability to work hard and just really, really get on with it. I'm pretty passionate about kind of mentoring up and coming young athletes across all disciplines. But that's the one thing I say to them. Where's your plan? How are you going to do that? And I can always remember someone said to me, plan to dive and dive the plan. And if you don't have a plan to support that goal, well, then you're not taking ownership. And I'll tell you a little story about how I kind of did that. And if you can imagine a pyramid, and a pyramid in Egypt is made of massive granite blocks, foundation all the way up to the very top. And at the top would be my 45, sub 45 seconds. And in 2007, I rode it out. And at the very top, I rode 44.80. And at that time, I was running 45.2, so about half a second off that. And I remember writing it down and thinking, that's fast. I don't know if I could do that. But when I started building the blocks, starting from the foundation, who was my team around me? Who were the people that I could challenge? What did I need to do? Okay, I needed to get faster over 200. I needed to get stronger in the gym. I needed my nutrition to be world class. When I put all these blocks together, I could actually see the path. I then surrounded this whole pyramid with images that inspired me. I made little confidence peaks, little times that I climbed the peak. So my move to England, 
when I won in 05, when I won in 07. And I reminded myself of these on an ongoing basis. And I redefined it, but it was on my wall for years. Now, when I retired, I went back to England and I had to clean out the house and I was coming back to Dublin and I was in the loft and I found this. And I remember picking it up. And at this point I had retired, my career was over. And I lifted up this notice board and I looked at the top of that pyramid and it was 44.80 and my PB was 44.77. So when I wrote that, I didn't know I was going to get it, but I had a plan in place and that was my goal and I achieved my goal. If there's a board that's at home now, what's on it? It's a very good question because I've had to redefine myself. So at the top of that pyramid now, it's my personal goals, my career goals, where I want to go in the corporate world. I have teamed up with Enda and part of the Motivate team now and we help professional sports people, but we also help a lot of professional corporate athletes in the corporate arena because what I've learned in sport about goal setting, resilience, high performance, all those things are extremely relevant today. We're all trying to strive. We all want to improve in ourselves. We all want to reach our goals. But it's amazing how many people you talk to that have no goals. You ask them, where do you want to be in two years? They don't know. So how are you going to fulfill your potential if you don't know where you're going? And it goes back to the whole ownership element. And that's where sports people who are successful, your they've Katie Taylor, they've had to do it. They've had to do they've it. To, and every single day. You got married last year to Charlotte. And I saw that lovely line that maybe came out of the MasterChef win was that you baked one of the wedding cakes. <laughs> But it was your granny who did the best ones. So tell me about your granny. Gran is 93, full of health. Good genes there in the Gillicks. Great genes, yeah, absolutely. My granddad, my dad's dad, he was 91. So I'm banking on maybe hitting 100. <laughs> yeah, all going well. But my gran is brilliant. She's absolutely fantastic. And I think it meant a lot for me to have her a part of the wedding. It was a case of when it came to the cakes that... I wanted something different. I wanted a table of cakes. I wanted a variety. And, but I wanted my grand's fruit cake because my grand just makes the best fruit cake she always has. And when I was in Loughborough, she used to send over a cake and stuff like that. And if I came home, she'd bake And there was a stage home. when you weren't eating that cake because it wasn't in the nutrition plan. It wasn't in the nutrition <laughs> plan, but it's about balance, you know, 80% good, 20%. But, it, you know, my grand is brilliant. She's extremely knowledgeable and it's just great. Even the other day I called in, I was just asking her about my granddad and they were all lived through the war in the Merchant Navy. My granddad got torpedoed and stuff like this. It's, it's fascinating what our, our grandparents have actually gone through. And she's just a great person to chew the fat, so to speak. I feel really kind of proud of myself that my grand has seen all my success Definitely, as well. Definitely, like. yeah. So what's life like now? Are you running? Are you cooking? I know you have a cookbook coming <laughs> yeah. out. But what's your day like? What's your routine? So it's taken a while. It's probably taken about two years to actually be happy in my routine. A few struggles along the way, not really sure what I wanted to do, where I was going, but I think I've found a bit of balance. I do have a cookbook coming out. It was a little project that I wanted to do, and I'm happy to say I've done it. I'm also putting something back into the sport with New Balance and Athletics Ireland. I have my own initiative called New Breed, where we're going into schools and we're looking to help find the next generation. So we get in, we do some coaching, and we test the athletes, and we just kind of promote athletics at grassroots level other sports are doing it athletics needs to be there this idea of going back into schools is brilliant and in some ways it's often when you talk to people that one person when they were a kid whether it's a teacher or a coach if it's sports that somebody said you know you've got something stick with it going back in there and perhaps potentially being that person with kids that you're going to meet it makes me wonder who did that with you i can remember in GAA terms, the Sam Maguire coming to our school. And I can, I can remember them coming into the hall. And Who came with it? It would have been back probably 95 when they won it. The whole squad was there. That inspired me. But we also had a teacher there, Miss Horgan, who was really big into athletics and Olympic handball of all sports as well. But she organised the athletics for the coming to Bun School every year. And that was kind of probably where my athletics really started. And what's fascinating about what you've done since retiring from competitive athletics is your back playing <laughs> GA football again. So when I retired from running, I, I, I tried to kind of keep fit 
by going out and running and going to the gym. But my body was sore, you know, to run at that intensity, to try and go out and do the sessions that I was doing before. My body kept breaking down. I kept getting little niggles and injuries and I got frustrated. And then I also had no goal. Now, I used to play GAA quite a lot. And my brother, he was playing for the senior team up in Ballantyre. And I kind of said to him one day, oh, I might go back and play a bit with the juniors or something. He was like, no, 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 you're not doing that. You're coming up for the seniors, you're coming up for the seniors. So... I went up and I said, okay, grand, I'll go up. So I went, we started training and we had a friendly match. I was thinking I might get 10 minutes, a bit of a run out. But they started me in midfield because I could run. And that was it. And uh, I enjoyed it. And it's going pretty well. And how did they respond to you coming back? Because you are a big sporting star. And that's why I think it's so brilliant. Because a lot of people, they stand back when they have that level and may not be willing to go back in at the ground and be open to will it work, will it won't. But how did they take it? They just took it like normal, to be honest. Uh, But to be fair to Ballantyre St. John's, they've always kind of kept the link with me throughout my whole career. Like any success that I had, they'd always throw a night or do something like that. So I never kind of felt that I'd left them. And I think in Ireland, we have our true colours. Like everyone knows our true colours, where you're from, your parish, your local area. We're quite passionate about that. And I think... The guys just accepted me as David Gillick and nothing else. And, and sure, when you're home, wouldn't you come back and play for us? That's, you you know, what else you'd be doing? Yeah, what else would you be doing? <laughs> exactly. But it's great fun and like the lads are great and we've got a good little squad there. And um, like, yeah, like I'm always there to help if anyone's any particular questions or anything like that. But I do try and take a, a step back from the coaching side. And, like they have asked, would, would I take a session here or there? And I do, but I'm, I'm a player and I like just to come up and just get on with it. And it's nice to be in the team with the lads as well. Like. And in a sense, we've talked about what's on that board and what the future might hold. But there's equally that sense in which you've made it clear you'd love to give something back. I've been really struck and puzzled by, you know, there's a handful of people who've retired from competitive athletics in this period. And yet I don't see them involved in the mentoring, say, for Rio 2016. You talked about a period at 2005 after Madrid or maybe it was left up to you what you did Mm. have things changed I think there has been changes yes and there's been changes for the better I think there is areas that still need a lot of improvement and uh, like that time in 2005 I would have loved to have a mentor there someone that maybe had gone through it and is now giving something back and helping the next generation just marking your card absolutely absolutely and I don't think there's certain elements of, say, Athletics Ireland or even the Sports Council are good at the transitional phase and preparing athletes who go through the system, are funded, and then, you know, they come to that retirement age. There is that couple of months or years that athletes struggle with the transitional phase. And if you feel that you're not supported there, it can turn a bit sour, it can turn a bit bitter. And I think in order for athletics to grow and, and flourish and move forward, we need athletes to get back involved. We need that system that they come back again and push forward. And I decided, you know what, like I'm in a position where I can give something back. And I've tried and sometimes I've met brick walls and I kind of get frustrated with it. And I'm just like, oh, they don't want to develop. And David, you talk about winning as a drug, a clean drug that has dominated your career. But what about drugs in sport? In a sense, we can't avoid it, the whole issue of doping. It's a, it's an interesting one now that I'm retired. I can kind of openly talk about it. When you're an athlete, you're very focused on yourself. Yes, the drugs issue is always there, but when you're standing on the track, if I start focusing on what other people are doing, I lose focus on myself. You can't control what other people do, so you can only control the controllables. Now that I've retired, I do kind of look back at even some of my own races where I was beaten by various athletes and you kind of wonder that guy was dodgy that guy was dodgy or in particular in 2009 when I finished sixth in the world champs the guy who won he got done for drugs a couple of months later on so that does kind of put a few queries into your head but like you can't think like that you can't think like that but I think fundamentally we're not tough enough on drug cheats we're allowing them back in We're giving them a slap on the wrist and saying, yeah, okay, take a rest and come back in two years. Now, they've extended that band to four, which does kind of put a spanner in the works. But if you look at Justin Gatlin, who's currently the fastest man over 100 metres, and up until very recently, Bolt produced a time that hopefully will beat him because nobody wants to see Gatlin win. He's failed drugs twice, which is now a lifetime ban, but not when he tested positive for a second time. So he's back, and he's back running. And that 
And behind him, to make matters worse, you've got Tyson Gay as well. So we're not tough enough on the drugs and it's just not good for the sport. From the profile, from people watching it just going, look, anyone that wins is on drugs. So to paint everyone with the one brush. That's very frustrating from a clean athlete's perspective because when you watch athletics on the TV, you don't see all the hard work that goes in. You don't see the sweat, the tears, the long days in the cold, the wet, the wind. You know, people don't see The rows over the omelet. The rows over the omelet, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> But that's what goes into it, and people don't really see that. So when someone throws a comment like, oh, they're all on drugs, that hurts. And there's been times when people have questioned me. I've come home from a medal, I remember, in 2007, and I had changed my training. Obviously, I was in Loughborough, and yeah, I, I was on a gym program for the first time in my life. Obviously, I was going to put on a bit of muscle. I was going to lean up. I was looking after my diet. And someone said to me, oh, come on, look at you. She, you must be on it. And I was a bit like, how rude are you? Like, you don't know a thing about athletics. You've just watched one race and think you know it all. So there is that side of it as well. But I do think fundamentally we need to get tough on it. We need to bring in life bans. They're talking about it, criminalising it. And hopefully that's the way to go. And I suppose when we get back to that idea of what you're going to be saying to those kids when you go into schools, if there was one message, one mantra that comes from all those boards... And all of those years, what would you be saying? I think it's very simple. It's have a goal and own that goal. Make it yours. I was recently giving a talk to the Leinster squad. And one of the issues I spoke about was the fact that when they're in that changing room, before they go into a stadium of 50,000 people, 80,000 people, they get nervous. A lot of people don't experience those nerves or that adrenaline rush. And that alone... When I used to get that, told me, I'm alive, I'm living. A lot of people don't experience that. And we're very fortunate to experience that. Don't let it go. Great advice. David Gillick, athlete, cook and coach. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to a podcast from our series, The Family of Things. To find out more or to listen to other episodes in this series, go to our website, thefamilyofthings.com.